So um, well, welcome to CS 11, uh, 747 uh, Neural Networks for NLP. Um, apparently this class is at capacity, um, which means there's a waiting list. I thought that meant we wouldn't have any seats, uh, but fortunately we do, so that's good, uh, good news. Um, so first, um, I, I'm going to give a little bit of introduction about why this class might be interesting. Um, then I'm going to talk about the class uh, structure and, and format and everything for a little bit. While. So, um, yes, let me switch over here. And um, so I guess the motivation for why you would want to use neural networks for natural language processing is uh, because language is hard. Um, and I would like to give a couple of examples of why this is hard, including... Um, this, distinguishing whether these sentences are grammatical or not. So um, if we have sentence number one, uh, is this grammatical? Yes or no? Yes? Okay. Uh, number two? No. Um, so why is that? <laughs> I have a whole room full of uh, people from the Language Technologies Institute and others, and nobody can tell me why this is wrong. Yeah, okay, the, the, the words are in the wrong order, okay. Um, so what about this one? <laughs> missing, missing words. Uh, it, this has no determiners, so that's a perfectly logical choice in uh, Chinese or Russian, but it's not a logical choice in English, so, you, uh, so this is wrong. Uh, what about this one? Yeah, conjugated wrong. Um, and what about this one? <laughs> yeah, you can you can go. Um, go for it. Um, so basically, um, then what about this one? Okay, sure. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you can see. Uh, you can see things are pretty complicated. Uh, we, we start from the obviously wrong ones where we have things just in the completely wrong order for English. Uh, then we go, on to, um, uh, we go on to things where it's conjugated wrong or missing words. Uh, then we go on to things where it's grammatical but uh, kind of semantically incorrect. Then we have exceptions to these uh, you know, semantic rules where a food truck kind of is a store. It sells things. but. Um, it has the ability to go as well, which makes things a little bit more complicated. So um, if we want to come up with engineering solutions for this, because that's what we do as NLP people, um, for the first ones, we could do something like create a grammar of the language. So if you took grammars and lexicons, uh, you're probably very tired of doing this. <laughs> or or maybe, you, maybe you like it. Uh, it either goes in one of those two directions. Um, then you also need to consider morphology of words and exceptions. Um, uh, you need to consider semantic categories and preferences. Uh, so, for example, a store is not something that can go. Um, and then you also have exceptions to all of these. So building this is, is difficult. And um, then what about these sentences? Uh, can anyone answer this? No? <laughs> maybe, maybe a few people in this room can. But uh, basically, these are just Japanese translations of all these sentences here um, with the appropriate mistakes. Um, but while most of the people here could probably build a rule-based system or lexicon grammar for English, it would be a lot harder because you'd need to learn how to do uh, Japanese first. So to summarize, we have morphology, we have syntax, we have semantics and world knowledge, um, we have Discourse, uh, we have pragmatics, so like where, where would we want to, uh, where would it be appropriate to say something like this? Um, and we have multilinguality, so we might, might want to build this for lots of different languages. Um, and all of these things are hard, obviously, they all have nuance, uh, etc. So the motivation for neural nets for NLP, um, it, which is also kind of the motivation for statistical models uh, or data-driven models for NLP in the first place, is they're a tool to do hard things. And they do hard things because they allow us to learn from data without writing down everything ourselves. Um, and 
This class will hopefully give you some of the tools to handle the problems you want to solve with NLP. And also, one of the main goals of it is to kind of, when you see a problem, how should I build a neural network model to solve this particular problem? And it will give you lots of examples of doing this and uh, some practical practice in doing so as well. So I'd like to talk about the class uh, format and structure. So uh, the way the class is formed, um, before the class, uh, we have a, uh, a short reading on the material of the class. Uh, the motivation for this is because um, I like the class to be very interactive and have lots of discussion and questions. Um, if we didn't have this, then there would be less meaning of people being here to the, uh, to the class. You could just watch a video online and get the same. So I, I'd like people to come here with a basic understanding of the topic. Then I'll go over um, in class. Uh, I'll, I'll summarize, elaborate, and uh, take any questions about this. Um, the summarization will be relatively short, and then I'll elaborate on some kind of recent topics and my personal opinions on things, um, and then take questions. Um, before the class, just to make sure that people did the reading, there's a short quiz. This is designed to be super easy if you did the reading. Um, uh, in reality, I've had more or less success uh, about it being super easy, but we also dropped your two lowest quizzes, so um, uh, there's that. Um, and also, somewhere in the class, the goal is for every class to have some demonstration of how you actually implement these things in code. Um, and the code will be uh, made available online as well. And then after class, this is actually super important. Um, I would like people, this is not mandatory, um, but I hope that people would do stuff like review the reading one more time, review the code, um, and then if you try to run or modify it yourself and visit the office hours to talk about any questions you have. So this, um, this class, I'm not going to teach you how to do everything in the class. A lot of it is going to be uh, learning by doing. And if you don't have a lot of experience with neural networks, the best way to do this is to try out the sample, uh, the sample code, modify it in a way to do something interesting. And then if you don't get it to work, or if it's not working for you for some reason, then you can talk to the TAs. And all the TAs are very good at uh, implementing these things. So um, that's the basic format uh, of how I view this. Um, we have uh, assignments. So this is very important. The assignments are group-based assignments. Um, your groups should be of uh, size two or three. Uh, that means one is not allowed, um, and also four is not allowed. So uh, two, two or three. Um, in a very rare case, I might make an exception to this, but uh, I, actually, no, I won't make an exception. To this. <laughs> that, that would be a lot of work for me. So no, no exceptions. Two, two or three. Um, so before we just had, uh, last semester we just had two assignments, um, but one thing I realized last semester is that actually setting up the, uh, the environment and deciding what you do, what you want to do, uh, it can be a bottleneck for some people. So before we actually do the assignments, we have a simple initial uh, questionnaire and environment check. So. What I would like people to do is fill out a, um, a questionnaire about, uh, sorry, this is kind of not in order. So um, uh, fill a questionnaire about what task you're interested in uh, tackling and also a log file from a simple benchmark program that you run on in your environment. And this is just to show us that you've set up a neural network, uh, an environment where you can run neural networks. If you already have used neural networks with a toolkit such as PyTorch or Dynet or something like this, uh, then running this program should be trivial, uh, should be more or less trivial. If you haven't done this before, you'll have to set up your environment before this assignment. Um, so one thing I should mention about the assignments in the project is all of these are kind of based on doing a final project where you do something new and interesting. Um, but for assignment one, the idea is we have a number of uh, recommended tasks on the website. Uh, you can go in and look at the tasks and say, oh, this task sounds really interesting. Um, I would like to try this uh, as part of my final project. I would like to try to create a model that tackles this task. And then for the first assignment, you need to survey the field, uh, kind of 
surrounding that task and, uh, and summarize the things, and also implement a simple uh, baseline model. This has to. This doesn't have to be anything complicated. It doesn't need to be uh, state of the art, um, but you just have something that works uh, and gives a number. Um, gives a number that's not too embarrassing. So we, we need to be able to see that the model that you implemented is working as you expected, but it doesn't need to be the state of the art. Um, for assignment two, you need to re-implement a model uh, basically from scratch. Uh, of course, you can use a neural network toolkit. You can use fragments of code from other places. But basically, you, uh, you need to implement from scratch uh, a, a state-of-the-art model or a model that's relatively recent on a particular task. Um, this assignment is not easy. I should warn you ahead of time. Um, this assignment requires you to basically um, figure out the data setup, figure out the hyperparameters of the model, et cetera, and, um, and uh, implement something that, uh, that other people have done. Um, and of course, the TAs and everybody will be very happy to help you out with doing this. Um, but I would suggest that you get started early and, um, and ask lots of questions in the process of doing this. Yeah? A lot of state of the art models already have implementations. You cannot use those. You have to do it from scratch. Yeah. Um, and uh, I'm happy uh, to discuss this. Part of the initial questionnaire is for you to um, kind of come up with options for papers that you might be interested in implementing. And I'm happy to give feedback about things that are like, no, this would be too hard. Um, or, or no, this is not no longer interesting. And uh, I'd like you to do something more recent or, or something. Um, then for the final project, um, you can perform a, a kind of unique project that either uses some of the methods that you learned in the class to improve on the state of the art, uh, accuracy-wise, speed-wise, or whatever, or take the thing that you implemented for assignment two, which might be on a different task, and apply it to a task of your interest and tailor it to that particular task. Um, so uh, that, that's the, the general idea. Um, uh, then the instructors in office hours, uh, the, I'm the instructor, as you might have guessed. Um, we have six TAs uh, who will be happy to help you out on any day of the week except Thursday. Uh, so if you want advice on Thursday, you're, you're out of luck. <laughs> no, uh, just kidding. And on Piazza, we have a Piazza, so you can ask questions on Piazza 24-7, uh, and we'll try to answer uh, relatively promptly. Um, TAs, uh, maybe everybody could stand up. Uh, Chisa? And uh, maybe you can say a word about what you're, what you're good at. <laughs> <laughs> like everybody, everybody's good at neural networks, but what's your, what's your research area? Uh, I'm working on transfer learning right now, uh, on, and also working on machine translation. Uh, I'm good at learning how to translate. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and. Um, and Hero? Um, I think I told you I am available on Thursday. So, um, oh, did you? <laughs> okay, so uh, now, now we've covered every day of the week. Thursday, 10, 11. Yeah. Uh, okay. I'm working on reading comprehension now. Uh, the most comparable framework for me is PyTorch as well. Mm -hmm. Inferin? Uh, I'm working on natural language generation currently, and the the framework I'm comfortable with is <laughs> <laughs> And uh, Zahan? Uh, so I'm working on generating words in Japanese. My mother is Chinese for Indonesians. So that's it. And Junjie? Yep. Um, uh, I'm Junjie. I'm working on machine translation and programming. So my first research is PyTorch and Chinese. And Paul? Yeah. Uh, I've been working in MT and NLI, and I'm good at that. So. Good. Um, yes, so everybody, um, some announcements will be done on Piazza. Uh, so um, I, I would like everybody in the class to be in, enrolled in Piazza. Um, I might not send things out by, via email, so it, it's your responsibility to check the announcements here. Um, so that's, that's about it. There's very, very detailed 
explanation of the assignments online. Um, I prefer to have more detail uh, just so things are clear. But if you have any questions about that, please ask as well. Um, so OK. So now I'll, uh, are, are there any other questions? Sorry. No? OK. Um, so now I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about neural, uh, neural networks and why they're uh, a good tool for doing, um, doing hard things like the ones I talked about before. So let's say we have an example prediction problem, uh, like sentence classification. Um, so we have, I hate this movie, uh, I love this movie, um, and we have, uh, we want to do classification into very good, good, uh, neutral, bad, or very bad um, for both of these. So for the first one, what, what is the answer here? This is the easiest question you'll get the answer. <laughs> yeah, very bad, okay. And then prob probably very good, right? Um, so, a first way we could do this that probably just about everybody in this class has uh, some experience with is bag of words. So, the idea here is that we, for each word we have in our input, we look up um, a vector of five values, uh, where each of the values in indicates how um, uh, each of the values indicates how likely each of the classes is. So number, value number one is very good, value number two is good, etc. cetera. Um, and then we do this for all of the words here. Um, we also have something uh, called a bias. So the bias is the, um, how likely each of the classes is. So maybe very good is much more likely than very bad. So uh, the bias vector would have a positive value for the first one. Um, and a, maybe a negative value for the second one. We add them all together and we get scores. Um, and then we might do something like take a softmax to turn them into probabilities. But um, the softmax is not important. Uh, basically, we have scores. And the idea here is this is the most simple way you can do classification. Each word has a score for each class. Um, and we add them all together to get our answer. Um, and if we think about this, in, in this case, what do our vectors represent? Of course, each word has its own five elements. And for example, hate will have a high value for very bad, et cetera. So this is actually a really powerful way of doing classification. It's a classification in easy cases. You can get really far with this, like topic classification, et cetera. Topic classification for documents, et cetera. Um, but similarly, you can come up with uh, examples that break this really easily. So I don't love this movie uh, would be one example. Um, so what is the value of this? Yeah, it's, it's difficult, but maybe, maybe bad, maybe neutral. Um, and what about there's nothing I don't love about this movie? Yeah, this is great. Um, so if you think about it, you know, this is difficult. We have I don't love, so it gets negated, and then nothing I don't love. Uh, you can't just look at the words in these sentences and decide, uh, and decide which is which. So there's actually um, a challenge that was run in a workshop last year uh, called the Build It, Break It Challenge, which is this, uh, this challenge where you have two types of uh, entries. One entry is people who like to build models, like maybe the people in this class who would build a neural network model or whatever model to kind of do natural language processing, then you have another team of people uh, who tries to break these models by coming up with minimal pairs of sentences where if you do something like add don't, uh, suddenly it changes. Um, or you add a conjugation and something, suddenly something changes. So it's easy to break uh, it's easy to break a bag of words model by just adding words or rearranging the words or something like that. So obviously something is more, uh, we need something more uh, powerful, I guess. So what we do is we have, um, we have combination features. Uh, one way to do this is with, through combination features. And combination features are something that says, we don't just look at the words don't in love, but we look at the fact that we have both don't and love in the sentence at the same time. Um, or maybe we have don't and I and love and nothing, uh, which is something like nothing I don't love. Um, 
And all of these exist in the same time, so this is obviously an indicator that this is a good uh, positive sentence, right? So um, the basic idea of neural networks, uh, for NLP tasks anyway, is that these are really, really good ways of extracting these combination features. That's the entire job of neural networks from the point of view of NLP. Um, and of course, it's not just looking at which ones uh, exist in the sentence, it's also looking at their order, it's looking at, uh, at various other things. But the idea is that by extracting features, then we get a better feature vector that allows us to calculate these scores more, more accurately. Um, and then we can turn them into probabilities if we want. Um, so a first way we could do this um, is we take, we look up word vectors for each of these uh, words, and then we multiply them by a matrix and add a bias and calculate scores. So basically what this is saying now is instead of taking these scores directly and adding them up in, uh, in instead of taking these vectors directly and adding them up into scores, um, we're taking features of the words in some way um, where each of these four red dots is a feature of the word. And then we're multiplying these uh, and doing a transform of these to get uh, the things that will finally become our scores. So the first red dot there could be something like, this tends to be a positive word. That, that would be a feature um, of a word. Then the second dot there might be something like, this is a negation. Uh, it could be don't, it could be not, it could be uh, a bunch of other things. Um, in addition, for the third and fourth ones, we could have random things like the topic of the word or, or whatever else. So these red dots, we don't really know what they are. But what we do know is now our vectors represent something a little bit more rich. They represent common, commonalities between the words that we have. Um, so yeah, it could be animate, it could be a uh, positive word, et cetera. Um, so still, we don't have any features that combine things together. Uh, these are still just adding together words and multiplying them by something. But now at least each of the words that we have is a little bit more, it's represented on a more abstract level. And we might be able to take it uh, into account that we have commonalities between words uh, to allow our model to generalize better. Um, now let's make things a little bit more interesting. Um, so this is a model uh, called deep continuous bag of words. Um, so what this does is this basically takes the, the model that I talked about before. It adds up a whole bunch of features of the words. Um, and after it does this, it um, multiplies the words by, um, by a matrix, adds a bias vector, and then takes uh, something like a nonlinear function, like a, a hyperbolic tangent function. And it does this a couple times, uh, use, uses this to extract features, and then uses these to, uh, to calculate the final scores. So um, this is a very abstract uh, like description of this model. Uh, which I'm going to talk about in more detail in, uh, in future classes. But basically, the interesting thing here is if we do something like this, if we do these multiplications and taking nonlinearities, we can now learn uh, more interesting things. So for example, um, we can learn feature combinations that say a node in the second layer might be that feature one and feature five are active. So let's say feature one is um, whether it's a positive word or not. And feature five is whether the, it's a negation or not. So after, um, after doing this transformation here and turning it into the purple vector, uh, these things are now combination features that could express the exact things that I talked about before. Like we have the words don't love or uh, not the best. Um, and this allows us to basically come up with much richer models than we had before. Um, there's a paper on the, on the schedule that you can take a look at. And um, the paper on the schedule, um, uh, on the schedule for today's class uh, demonstrates that this deep uh, continuous bag of words model is actually almost as good 
as all of the complicated things that people had come up with before it. Um, it it's a paper called Deep Unordered Composition Rivals Other, uh, other Models for, uh, for Sentence Classification or something like that. And it's showing that even with a simple, extremely simple thing like this, where we rep represent each word as a feature vector, um, do a couple transformations of this and then make a prediction, can do uh, quite well on sentence classification tasks. Um, so, uh, so the idea here is that what we want to do is we want to design our feature functions, we want to design our transformations in a way that's appropriate for the task that we're trying to do. Um, and for sentence classification, that might be something like just adding them all together and then uh, than doing a few nonlinear transformations. But for other tasks, we'll need to come up with things that are uh, more appropriate, I guess. Um, so I, I have to apologize. My, um, my charger is falling out here, and I'm going to run out of battery <laughs> very quickly if I don't hold it in here. So I might not be able to move around very much. But uh, <laughs> uh, Unless somebody here has a major in like mechanical engineering and can make, make sure my uh, charger uh, sticks in there. But, um, are, are, there any, are there any questions so far? No? I think this is all pretty basic stuff, uh, but I, I feel like I should, uh, I should talk about it uh, here uh, first, because this is first class. Um, could, I, could I borrow that? That would be awesome. <laughs> awesome, you have saved the class. Thank you. <laughs> okay. So um so now I, I want to talk a little bit more about this, um, what is a neural net? Because what I talked about before was just adding a bunch of things together and multiplying, multiplying, taking a few nonlinear functions like a hyperbolic tangent. But um, the name neural nets, uh, as many people know, originally came from neurons in the brain, um, where we had, uh, where we had neurons, and um, basically the way these work with a lot of simplification uh, to the point that even I, who is not a neuroscientist, can understand, is these squiggly things on the left side uh, all take uh, stimuli, stimuli from other neurons. And it, once the stimuli reaches a certain, uh, electric stimulus reaches a certain point, then the things on the right side, um, they you know, basically uh, give off their own stimulus. And that's what's going on in our brain. Um, and the, this is the motivation for the name neural networks, but now um, basically the way what neural networks have come to mean is a, something called the computation graph for a calculation that uh, is called a computation graph. Um, and most anything that can be expressed this way is now considered a neural net. Um, so the, there's a big disconnect between the original motivation of neurons in the brain and what we, what we use now. Um, there was, people were talking about this on Twitter a little while ago, like uh, people talk about this on Twitter occasionally. Um, but the best one is, the best thing I saw was uh, neural networks are, uh, neural networks are basically chains of functions where each chain, where each thing in the chain is a, a block, and they're all differentiable uh, blocks, so you can optimize them. So we should just call them a blockchain instead of a neural network. <laughs> um, uh, but uh, I, I will call them a neural network uh, just to prevent confusion. Um, so to to express a computation graph a little bit more formally, um, we have something. Uh, we have an expression. And this expression is something that we want to calculate. And um, for example, uh, this expression could be our neural network that uh, did text classification or something like that. So as our input, we take a whole bunch of words. As our output, we have a prediction um, or a score over all of our classes. Um, so we take this expression and we uh, 
express it as a graph. Um, so if we have x, then x is kind of a node in the graph. And, uh, and this is a very, very simple graph. So each node could be, uh, is a, represents a value um, where the value is a tensor or a matrix or a scalar, vector or a scalar. Um, so uh, it, it can be you know, uh, a single value or it can be a whole uh, tensor of values. Um, now we can take our expression and we can make it a little bit more complicated. So instead of just x, which is a vector, we can call it x transpose. So now the way we, exp the way we express this is we take our original x and we apply, we add another node to the graph where the second node to the graph transposes the first node. So this is kind of a transpose node. So there's an edge in the graph um, and this edge is basically um, a function argument to this transpose function because transpose is a unary function. There's only one uh, edge going into this uh, node. Um, it also represents a data dependency, so we need to know x uh, before we can calculate uh, before we can calculate that second node. And yeah, a node uh, is a function of the other ones. And the important thing for neural networks um, is that each node needs to know how to differentiate it, uh, itself. So if we have a transpose, um, we, the node needs to know, uh, or transpose needs to be differentiable, or at least uh, something called subdifferentiable, which is like a differentiation that's not necessarily continuous. Um, we can have any kind of function as long as it satisfies this, uh, this criterion of being differentiable. So um, transpose is a unary function, but um, you can also have binary functions like a matrix multiply uh, or unary functions uh, like a sum, for example. Um, so computation graphs are directed in a cyclic. Um, you can ignore the indinet part. Uh, this is just because I copied and pasted these slides from something else. Um, but in general, in any framework that you use, uh, usually these are directed in a cyclic graphs. Um, so for example, you could uh, do something like uh, a matrix times uh, a matrix times X, even though you've already used X previously. Um, and then we could do something else like this, uh, where we multiply vectors and then we, uh, we add a constant and we get an expression like uh, x transpose ax uh, plus b times x plus c. So this ends up being a, a scalar in a way of, of calculating things. So you see the sum up there is, uh, has, uh, is uh, ternary, it has three uh, edges going into it. So, now we have this big graph um, and we can say y equals. So y equals is an assignment and an assignment basically is a labeling of a node in the graph. So if we say y equals uh, x transpose times a times x plus b times x plus c, the y equals is basically just a pointer to the node in the graph like this. Um, so this is kind of the connection between the expression and the graph here. Um, and any function we define as a neural network will basically uh, consist of us defining these, uh, these functions like this. Um, so are, are there any questions uh, so far? No? Okay. So there are two, or there are a number of different algorithms that uh, we need to do in neural networks. And in reality, um, you know, maybe five years ago or, or f five to ten years ago, if you wanted to implement a neural network, you would do all of these yourself. You would uh, write some C++ code that does, um, or some NumPy code that does all your matrix multiplies. You would derive all the gradients uh, for the things that you wanted to do, and uh, you would write your forward, uh, you would write your forward calculation there. But now. Um, the way we implement things is usually with a neural network toolkit, such as PyTorch or Dynet or TensorFlow or something like that. Um, 
So the algorithm, uh, the first algorithm is graph construction. So you create the graph. Um, the second algorithm is forward propagation. So basically what this does is in topological order, you can compute the value of the node given its inputs. Um, so the way forward propagation works is basically um, you take this and you can step through the graph and gradually one by one uh, calculate these values. So this goes on behind the scenes in most of your neural networks toolkits, uh, neural network toolkits, and you can, um, you can basically calculate this value and it will spit it out for you. Um, this is actually true for any programming language also. Um, you can actually do this calculation in any programming language also, like NumPy, NumPy, sorry, any numerical library, you could do this in, uh, in NumPy uh, itself. So what, what's the difference between NumPy and a neural network toolkit? And the main difference is that a neural network toolkit also implements two additional algorithms uh, that are not just related to computation, but they're related to actually uh, training parameters of your model. So one, one is backpropagation. And basically what backpropagation is, is it's the opposite of uh, the, forward calcula uh, the forward calculation that you do uh, when you calculate the function, you go in reverse topological order. And instead of calculating the values itself, uh, you calculate the derivatives of uh, each of the functions that you're using here. Um, and you calculate the derivatives of the parameters for the, in, for the model with respect to some value. And usually this value is something uh, called a loss function, uh, which is a value that you want to minimize to uh, because the loss function corresponds to your, um, how bad your model is performing. So you want to minimize it to improve the, uh, how well your model is performing. Um, then once you do this, uh, you then do a parameter update that moves the parameters in the direction of, uh, or moves the parameters to reduce this loss value. And um, you multiply this derivative uh, this is the simplest kind of update function that you use. Uh, you multiply this, uh, this derivative by alpha, which is a learning rate and, um, and update parameters. So all of this I'll talk about in detail in the future, but uh, in, uh, in maybe next time or next next time. Um, but the important thing here, uh, just to reiterate, is that a neural network now is a computation graph. A uh, computation graph is a data structure that represents a computation that you want to do. The condition of the computation graph is that all of the nodes need to be differentiable. And as long as all of the nodes are differentiable, you can use, uh, you can use back propagation to calculate the derivatives of the things at the beginning of uh, the computation graph, which are usually parameters. And if you can do this, you can update your model to improve its performance. Um, so that is, uh, that's kind of the broad overview of uh, what a neural network um, model looks like in, uh, in very abstract terms. So uh, I'll give um, a couple uh, examples. Um, there are neural network um, frame, there's a bunch of neural network frameworks. There's probably a hundred uh, to 200 neural network frameworks now. Um, I guess the first major one that was, that's still in use now is uh, Theano. Um, there's also a kind of uh, famous one in computer vision called CAFE. Um, there's one called Dynet, which you might or might not have heard of, but it's one that I make, so I have to mention it. Uh, <laughs> there's another one called Chainer. Um, MXNet, uh, TensorFlow, and uh, PyTorch. And these are kind of arranged on the left side to the right side. Um, does anyone know what the, the difference between the left side and the right side is? Yes, exactly. Static versus dynamic. So um, I, I recommend that you use a dynamic framework for, uh, for neural networks when you implement uh, things for natural language processing. And the reason why is because it makes uh, a lot of things that, a lot of the more complicated things that you want to do easier, um, and it often can be easier to debug. Uh, one thing I should mention is that both MXNet and TensorFlow recently have support for this uh, kind of dynamic uh, stuff. 
but it's kind of added on in the uh, like post hoc. So my my personal recommendation is to use Dynet or PyTorch. Um, they're both uh, they're both good frameworks. Dynet's uh, has some attractive properties for uh, NLP. PyTorch also has uh, some attractive properties over Dynet as well. And I'm happy to discuss those uh, later if you're interested. Um, so the basic training process in a dynamic neural network framework, if you want to implement uh, something, is at the very beginning, uh, you create a model. You define your model parameters. Um, then for each example, for each training example, you step through and create a, a graph that represents the computation that you want to perform. Um, so that would, be, uh, that would be basically analogous to the graph that I, I talked about just now. Um, and then you uh, calculate the result of that computation. And if you're training, uh, you perform backpropagation over uh, um, the thing that you want to uh, minimize. And then you, uh, you uh, update the parameters. So I'm going to pull up a kind of concrete example of this in uh, just a second now. Sorry, it's the first class, so I forgot to pull up the code example uh, before we uh, before we started, but I'll pull it up just now. And so the first example that I'd like to pull up is uh, a bag of words. So a bag of words, you do not need a neural network tra uh, framework to train a bag of words, but if you want to train a bag of words using a neural network framework, you can, uh, just like any other, um, just like any other function. So I will open up. Jupiter. And I will first remember my Jupiter uh, syntax. So we have. Um, So the way you would implement something like this is um, the first thing you do is you, uh, you import things. Uh, I assume most people here know Python, right? Uh, no, no problem with Python? OK. Um, so then the second thing you do is you, uh, you basically read in the corpus that you want to read. Um, one important thing when you're when you're doing things in neural networks in neural network land is neural networks like integers, uh, integer IDs because everything in uh, in neural networks is basically a oh where's the chalk everything in neural networks is basically a uh, like a matrix or a tensor or something like that so um, we generally, the first thing we do when we read in a corpus is we convert it into integers. Um, and then the integer ID, like let's say the word the has an integer ID of three, uh, we'll use that to basically pull out the, the third row in our matrix uh, and use that as our, our vector of, of parameters. So, um, and let, let, me, uh, let me also first show you uh, what the data looks like here. So as I said, we're doing a, a text classification task. Um, and the text classification task is um, a sentiment analysis task using the Stanford, uh, the Stanford sentiment tree bank. And it has sentences uh, from, from uh, Amazon reviews, I believe. And these uh, sentences from the Amazon reviews are things like, the rock is destined to be the 21st century's new Conan, and that he's going to make a splash even greater than Arnold Schwarzenegger, John claude Van Damme, or Steven Seagal. Um, this is rated as three, uh, which is good. I cannot think why this is not very good, but... Uh, <laughs> Uh, but it's rated as three, which is good. And then, uh, you know, you have other ones. And then if you look at a bad one, um, this is sour little movie at its core, an exploration in the, of the emptiness that underlay uh, the relentless gaiety of the 1920s, 
film's ending has a what was it all for. Uh, so yeah, this is, this is very bad. Um, so what we want to do is we want to take in this sentence and we want to, uh, to predict its class. And um, the way we will do this is with a bag of words model first. Um, so what we do is we first do our necessary imports. Uh, we define a function that allows us to read in our data set. Um, then we read in our data set. And after we've read in our data set, basically our training data um, contains things like uh, the sentence. Um, and the sentence is expressed as a whole bunch of integers. And then the sentence also has, a, uh, it also has an ID corresponding to the label. Um, so we do that, then we, um, we define a model. And um, this model basically will contain all our parameters. Then we have something uh, to train this model some, using something called Atom. I'll talk about this, uh, this later. Um, it's like the update rule where we, we add the derivatives, et cetera. And then um, what we do is we define two, um, we define two sets of parameters. One set of parameters is basically a matrix um, where we have the number of words by the number of tags. Um, so this is basically five tags, and then this is maybe uh, 500 or 5,000 words that are in our training purpose. Um, so in Dynet and a lot of other frameworks, this is, this is using Dynet because that's what I'm familiar with. But in Dynet and a lot of other frameworks, you have an idea of looking things up. So in this case, we have words. So we want to look up, uh, look up particular words. Um, so we have these things called lookup parameters. Uh, so we want to look up from 5,000 words, and we want to get a vector back of size 5. Um, then we also have the bias that I talked about before. This is just a vector um, uh, of size 5. And this helps uh, when like one of the tags is more common than the others. So we do this. Um, then the most important thing in the model, or the most important thing in our program is this uh, calculate scores uh, function. This calculate scores function will basically calculate the scores of each of the classes. Um, and if you wanted to come up with a new model for solving this uh, Stanford sentiment analysis task and you wanted to get the glory of briefly being the person who's best at sentiment analysis in the world, um, what you would do is you would modify this calc scores function and come up with some you know, clever model that allows you to, to uh, make the scores work better, uh, make the scores be calculated in a more accurate way given uh, your training data. So because uh, we're not really interested in, in glory uh, for this particular class, I'm going to do something very simple, which is basically where we, we look up um, for each word in our, um, for each word in our sentence, we look up the, uh, the appropriate, um, we look up the appropriate row from this and turn it into a vector. And then we sum all of these rows together to get a score. Um, we add our bias, um, we add our bias vector and we get uh, this. So you can see this is exactly the same thing that we were doing here. Uh, we, we look up for each of the words, a vector, um, add a bias, and we have our scores. So we have that. Then we have a bunch of, uh, of kind of code that we use to train the model. Uh, so we have our training data and our test data. We, um, we first randomly shuffle our training data. This is important for neural networks uh, because we're training in a kind of incremental fashion. I'll, I'll talk more about this later. Um, but we shuffle our training data. Uh, we step through our training data. And then we calculate a loss function um, called the, uh, the cross entropy loss, if you're familiar with it. I'll, I'll also explain about this later. Um, and then we, uh, we add up our loss, and then we update call the backward function, we update our parameters, et cetera. Then we also have a development uh, set where we want to uh, check our accuracy. So we similarly calculate the scores. Um, we get these as a NumPy array. We call the NumPy argmax function over the scores and then to get our prediction. 
And if uh, our prediction is equal to the true tag, uh, then we add one and say we, we got this correct. So then um, you can see that this is maybe 80 to 90 lines of code. Um, so then we run this and you can see it's, uh, it's training slowly and we can see our accuracy is going up. So I want, so this is just a bag of words model, um, but I guess the important thing here, the important things here are twofold. Um, one is that we, basically what we did is we calculated a function um, and within the neural network library, it calculates our derivatives of the function and does all the, all the necessary computation to optimize the parameters. And then we just run this and, uh, and, and we get a score. So this demonstrates how easy it is. Uh, you don't really need to know the internals of how things work to, um, to get started. But I will, of course, be teaching you about the internals of how all of this works as the course continues. Um, so this is, not, this is not super interesting. Um, so let's try something a little bit more complicated. Oh, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Um, can you talk a little bit about why and when dynamic frameworks are better? So I guess the, the easiest answer to that, why dynamic frameworks are better, is um, For example, here um, we have if predict if predict equals ta tag uh, we add test correct um, plus equal to one. So we're we're measuring our accuracy using this dynamic framework. Now let's say we wanted to do something a little bit more complicated, like if predict equals tag um, if predict equals tag one, then do one action and kind of create a new part of the neural network. Uh, if predict equals two, then we want to do some other action and create a new part of the neural network. Um, this is very simple to do in a dynamic framework, and it's a lot more work to do in a, in a static framework. And the reason why this is particularly useful for NLP is in NLP, we have a lot of kind of structured prediction problems where we have a tree structure or a, a graph structure. We have a lot of pro problems where we uh, one example would be, let's say you want to read something and then based on how you read something, you want to act differently next time. Um, and that's something that's a lot easier to do in dynamic frameworks. Another advantage, uh, which can be a pretty big advantage, is that you can do things like uh, debugging and profiling more easily in dynamic frameworks. But um, uh, I think the biggest one is they allow you to do things that would not be uh, easy normally in a static. Um, within your Python, uh, within your Python host code, also. So, um, in TensorFlow, a lot of the things I mentioned here you can actually do, but you need to learn the way of doing it in TensorFlow as opposed to doing it directly in Python, which you're probably already familiar with. Okay, um, I will stop this. So, I I'm going to skip doing the continuous bag of words and go directly to the deep continuous bag of words, uh, just. Uh, for the sake of time, for the so, let's um, let's see what happens when we want to turn this into a neural network. Um, so the the changes that we have to make are actually pretty minimal. So all of the all of the boilerplate code at the top is exactly the same, and the. The difference is that now we have a few parameters to our model, um, like what is the size of our hidden of our uh, word embedding, what is the size of these red uh, vectors here, and also what is the size of our hidden layer, um, uh, this this purple thing here, and also how many hidden layers do we have? Do we have uh, this one here? Do we have this one here, uh, etc. So then, uh, because each of the hidden layers has a few more parameters, it has this uh, weight matrix here and this bias vector here, this weight matrix here and this bias vector here. We also need to uh, define these, and we also need to define this weight and this bias. So we have a few more parameters than we had before. Um, we just define all of these to be the appropriate size. 
And now, um, now in our calculate scores function, we have um, we look up all of the word embeddings uh, and we sum them together like this. Um, so that, that gives us this thing here. Then we step through each layer in our, our neural network and we do a matrix multiply, we add a bias, uh, we take a nonlinearity, a tan H. So you can see these are basically, um, these are basically the same thing as the equations that I had written here. Um, and then we return uh, this as our score function instead. So by, by just changing two things, by changing what parameters we define, by changing um, our calculate score function a little bit, I was able to convert our bag of words model into a you know, neural network model. Uh, this, is a, this is a feed forward neural network model, so I, I think it, it's safe to call this a neural network. Um, and you can see how, I guess, the power of neural networks in that any function that you would like to calculate, you just need to define its parameters, you need to write a function that actually calculates it, and then you're, uh, you're ready to train your model. So we run this. Um, now I'll mention two unfortunate things about neural networks. Uh, one is that now we have a whole bunch of hyperparameters in our model, right? We have the hyperparameter, which is the size of the word embedding, uh, the hyperparameter, which is the size of the, uh, the hidden layer, and then we also have the number of hidden layers. And this is what goes with the territory in neural networks. You get this wonderful power to build these expressive models that you want to do, and lots and lots of hyperparameters to tune. So, I will also talk about how we tune these hyperparameters uh, effectively to get them to do what you want. The second thing is that things get slower. Um, you can see it got a little bit slower here. It's still pretty fast because we're still doing a pretty simple computation, but uh, it could be um, it could get a lot slower. Um, if you take a look here, now our model is achieving maybe 40% accuracy, where it was achieving 38% accuracy before. So we, uh, we improved our accuracy a little bit. But the, um, uh, I, of course, if you want to do more engineering with neural networks, you can do more engineering with neural networks for this task. This is just uh, an example. So uh, are there any questions about this? Yeah? yeah. So one of the issues with NLP is how do you batch stuff? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Um, so bad, batching stuff, I'm going to talk about that in a lot of detail in two or three classes, I guess. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I think I'll, I'll wait until then because I, I do have a pretty, uh, you know, I, I have a pretty extensive explanation of that in a couple of classes. So. Um, this one, I'm not doing that at all. Um, and in many cases, you don't even need to worry about that if you're using the appropriate, uh, if you're running, for example, a task on the Stanford Sentiment Tree Bank, it's relatively small and you don't even need to worry about batching. But for larger data sets? But for larger data sets, you do. Yeah. And that's actually one of the harder parts of, uh, of implementing models for NLP. Um, okay, so I will move on to the, uh, to a few things to remember going forward. So um, one thing to remember going forward um, is that neural networks are very, very powerful tools to have. There is a reason why most of the paper, research papers in NLP are using neural networks in some, uh, in some capacity. I actually was very skeptical of neural networks when they first started becoming popular. And the reason why is because you can't really um, you can't really understand what's going on inside of them. Uh, they have lots of hyperparameters, etc. cetera. Um, but in reality now, they give you so much freedom to do the kind of things that you want to do and they have so much capacity to learn interesting things that I think they're really indispensable uh, for your toolkit. Another thing to remember is that neural networks, um, basically they can approximate, they can model any function that you want them to model as long as you give them enough parameters and capacity. So a single layer uh, feed forward neural network, um, a single layer feed forward neural network can model any problem that you want to model. 
Um, there's actually a paper from 1989 that does machine translation with neural networks. And what they did was they took uh, 10 word sentences. Just pretend that that's 10. They turned it into one big vector. They took another vector of 10 word sentences and then they took a, um, they took a feed forward neural network and then they tried to predict this output here. Um, and theoretically, this can work. Theoretically, no matter how horrible your model is, um, as long as this hidden layer in here is wide enough, you can, you can come up with a model. Uh, it, as long as that hidden layer there is wide enough and as long as your data is large enough, a neural network should be able to learn any problem, uh, anything with regards to anything. Um, and it can, that includes any NLP problem. So neural networks theoretically can do anything, uh, can do anything that we uh, would like to do. Um, but there's two problems. One thing is language is hard and it's a particularly difficult thing for, uh, for neural networks because it has, um, words are basically discrete. Uh, you, you don't, in an image you have, uh, pixels in each pixel, if it's a little bit different, it doesn't make a big difference uh, in the image. But in, um, in language, if you change one character, then you, you get something with a big difference. Um, and that is particularly difficult for neural networks. And the more important thing is data is limited. Um, data is limited for any problem that we're interested in, including machine translation over French and English, where we can get hundreds of millions of sentences. Uh, but there's many more uh, interesting problems where we can't get hundreds of millions of sentences. We can't even get thou you know, thousands of high quality labeled examples. So because of this data is limited. So what we need to do is we need to design our models to have inductive bias. And what inductive bias means is basically we have to make it easy for them to learn the things that we think they should be learning. So if we think language has a tree structure we might want to design a network in a tree structure. If we think there's a particular feature of our particular model, uh, we should design our, our model in that way. And all of the things I'm going to be explaining for the rest of the class, basically um, we'll be trying to get this bias into our models in the appropriate way to make them work well for NLP tasks. So I'll very briefly go over the class plan. Um, so in section one, each section is about three classes, plus or minus two. So um, <laughs> at a very, very, very low level of precision, but it's uh, about that many. Um, so first I'll talk about uh, models of words. I'll talk about word representations or word embeddings, um, doing them using context, doing them using word form. And also an important thing for neural networks is how to make them fast enough, uh, which is, uh, involves batching. It involves a lot of other things that I'll be talking about as well. Um, the second thing is I'll be talking about models of sentences. I already talked about bags of words and, you know, bags of, uh, bags of words and continuous bags of words, et cetera. But I'll be talking about uh, much more powerful uh, things, including convolutional networks, recurrent networks and also how uh, applications uh, use these. Um, the next thing I'll be talking about sequence to sequence models or models for generating language conditioned on some other, uh, on some other type of language. Um, so this includes, for example, machine translation. It includes also dialogue response generation, uh, image captioning, uh, whatever. Um, and uh, a framework called attention that is uh, very useful and powerful there. Um, I'll also be talking about uh, structured prediction models. So these models are basically models where our decisions on the output side are kind of intertwined and I'll be talking about methods for handling these. Um, this includes kind of the sequence to sequence models that I was talking about before uh, because sequence to sequence models output multiple words and the words interact with each other. Um, but it also includes things like part of speech tagging, um, parsing, et cetera. And I'll be talking about uh, learning models and, uh, and also models that are, are good for this. 
Um, then we'll be talking about tree structures, because tree structures are, are very useful for language, uh, including syntactic parsing, semantic parsing, etc. I'll be also be talking about models of graphs. Um, and then advanced learning techniques. So I'll be talking about models uh, that use latent random variables. So these are uh, models where basically we have something um, that we haven't observed in our data, uh, but we would like to, uh, um, but we would like to basically use that variable to modify how our model uh, works. So this might include something where we have a tree, a latent tree in our, uh, in our model somewhere, where we predict the tree, then we use the tree to do something else. Um, I'll also be talking about adversarial networks. So these are probably something a lot of people have heard about, but uh, you use one network to generate something uh, and another network to kind of uh, discriminate between uh, whether that's good or not. Um, also, semi-supervised or unsupervised learning. So this is very important uh, because, as I mentioned, there's a lot of problems where we don't have a lot of uh, data, especially labeled data. And if we can use unlabeled data in an appropriate way, then we can, um, we can improve the accuracy of these models. Also, um, models of knowledge and context. When I say context, I mean context beyond uh, the context that we normally use within a sentence. So like. Uh, models of documents, including co-reference and discourse parsing, uh, learning from or for knowledge graphs, and also machine reading with, uh, with neural networks. Um, also, I'll be talking about, uh, we'll be talking about multitask and multilingual uh, models. So these include models that perform multiple tasks, like translation and part of speech tagging at the same time. Um, also, multilingual models that learn from multiple languages at the same time. And actually, I forgot one, but um, I, I think uh, L.P. Morenci will be giving something about multimodal models, where we have like speech and image, or speech and uh, speech, and, uh, sorry, text and image, or text and speech, uh, et cetera. And then finally, um, we'll be talking about advanced, uh, more advanced search techniques. So um, this is particularly important for models where uh, for structured prediction models where search is kind of uh, difficult. And there's been a bit of work on this uh, as well. So uh, I guess that is all for today. I'm happy to take any uh, final questions. Yeah. Can you be open to the recommendations for discussion papers for papers going into the Um. Oh, um, so if there are topics that you would like me to cover in the class, yes, I, I would be very open to that. Um, I won't guarantee that I'll do that if it doesn't fit in the content well, but um, I guess we could start a thread on Piazza or, or something like that. Um, yeah, sounds good. There's already about uh, 200 <laughs> reference papers that I'll be talking about, so I think if you have an interesting one, I'd be happy to add that and, uh, and uh, talk about it at the appropriate place. Um, any, anything else? Okay, uh, thanks a lot.